Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for, for giving up your time to attend the first If So EC Integrated Health webinar. I apologize in advance for having some slight technical issues, which should be resolved shortly. So you may not be able to, to see the video, but please bear with us and we'll, we'll address it as, as soon as possible. Our the webinar today is Bone Health Following Bariatric Surgery, Implications for Management, the Integrated Health Point of View. Our speakers today are Dr. Ben Porat and Laura Hewshin, and the panelists are Violetta Moisa, Bettina Dreschel, and Sherry Sherf Dagen. Um, I'm Dr. Yitka Graham, head of the Helen McArdle Nursing Care Research Institute in the UK, and proud member of the e If So EC Integrated Health Committee. I'd just like to tell you a bit about today. What we'll be doing prior to each of the speaker's talks is we'll be, we'll be undertaking some polls and we really encourage you to participate with these polls. So the session as, is as interactive as possible. I'd just like to introduce you to my esteemed colleagues. Dr. Tara Ben Porat serves as the head dietitian of the Bariatric Multidisciplinary Unit in the Hadassah Hebrew University Medical Center, Jerusalem, Israel and is a postdoctoral fellow at the Montreal Behaviour Medicine in Concordia University in Montreal. Our second speaker, Laura Hewshin, is a PhD candidate at the Vitalis Obesity Clinic and Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And Laura's got six months left on her PhD and we wish you all the luck in the world, Laura. We know you're gonna get, have a great, um, you'll be a great doctor. I'm joined by my panelists, Dr. Violetta Moise, who's a research and clinical nutritionist at the Unit of Obesity Hospital Clinic Barcelona, Associate Professor at the University in Barcelona, and is currently President of the Spanish Scientific Society of Dietetic and Nutrition and Board Member at SACO, the Spanish Society of Surgery for Obesity. Um, Bettina Dreschel is a clinical dietitian at the Vienna General Hospital and Board Member at the Austrian Association of Dietitians. She's doing her master's degree in nutritional medicine at the Medical University of Graz and the University of Applied Sciences, Johannium. And, um, and, and lastly, Dr. Sherry Scherf Dagen is a dietitian epidemiologist in the Department of Nutritional Sciences, School of Health Sciences, Ariel University, and Asuta Medical Centers in Israel. So I think we truly are a European committee here and, we, and we've come together on the subject of, of bone health. Um, so, Dr. Dr. Ben Porat will, will will begin her talk first. But I think we'd like to start. If we could start with the polls, please, prior to prior to her her talk. I think just take the time. If you just take the time to fill these in, please. Mm, fantastic. And we'll keep these on. We have we have four polls to go through, so we'll just move on to the second one when we get um when we get a bit further forward. Here we go, the second one. I've discussed bone health issues with patients pre or post surgery. Excellent. And our third poll here, would you refer patients with low bone mineral density values according to a DEXA scan to an endocrinologist? got some very firm opinions here, which is really interesting to see. Mm. 
And our final poll, all patients should undergo a DEXA scan following surgery. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to fill in those polls. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Tara Ben Porat. Hello, my name is Tair. I'm a clinical bariatric dietitian and a postdoctoral fellow. And I will talk in this webinar about bone loss after bariatric surgery, present the mechanisms and clinical practice. We'll talk about skeletal health, the effect of bariatric surgery on bone health, and uh, present the management strategies and clinical practice to attenuate bone loss after bariatric procedures. The bone is endlessly remodeled to maintain homeostasis, and these actions is being done by two main cells. We have osteoblasts, which are responsible for a bone formation, and osteoclasts, which are mainly responsible for bone resorption. And the action of these Please two cells is controlled by several up factors, shortly. a network of factors, including hormones, cytokines, nutrients balance, and mechanical loading. The purpose of remodeling is to regulate calcium homeostasis to repair micro damages of bone in daily in everyday stress and to shape the skeleton during the growth. When we have low vitamin D levels, it could impair calcium absorption in the gut. And therefore uh, we, we can have a situation which could be life-threatening of low uh, serum calcium levels. And then we have the secretion of the uh, parathyroid hormone, which causes mobilization of calcium from the bone to the blood to maintain norm serum uh, calcium levels. And this is the way the body preserves calcium uh, maintenance homeostasis. The, the bone is in linear growth during the early years of childhood and adolescence. And after the age of 30, when we reach the peak bone mass, which is the uh, highest amount of bone that we can achieve in life, we are on constantly bone loss. And this is actually a, a natural part of the aging process. Bone mineral density, BMD, is actually the amount of minerals in grams per the area scanned in DEXA scan. The T-score are the number of standard deviations above or below the mean for a healthy 30 years old adult at the same age, at the same sex and the same ethnicity. Osteopenia is a situation when we have more bone resorption that exceed the synthesis, and the T-scores would be below or between minus one, to minus 2.5. In osteoporosis, these scores are, uh, are below minus 2.5. And that situation, we have increased risk for fractures, which could be also al already appearing, and we have excessive protein and mineral loss. Here are some uh, skeletal status tests, which we use in research, but mostly in clinical practice setting. So mainly we use uh, the biochemical measures of serum calcium, vitamin D, phosphorus, albumin, PTH, and 24 urine uh, calcium secretion. And of course the DEXA scan, which is the, um, the, the most uh, known and the gold standard uh, modality to evaluate a bone. And um, it could predict fractures a risk. We also have the uh, bone uh, markers, uh, which could reflect uh, bone formation and bone resorption. These are sometimes used mostly in uh, research, but also in clinical practice and in, in the setting uh, of treating our patients, mostly to evaluate a skeletal status by endocrinologists. So how does bariatric surgery affect the bone? 
Generally, high body mass has positive effect on bone formation and weight loss is associated with decreased bone mineral density and increased bone resorption. The metabolic changes affecting the bone occurring following conventional weight loss could be a lot more extreme and extensive after bariatric surgery when we see the extreme weight loss and rapid weight loss. And uh, these are accompanied by several metabolic um, processes like hormonal change, changes, which will be discussed in the uh, next slides. The prominent uh, published literature that we have is derived mainly from gastric bypass surgery studies, but we know that we have negative effect of the bone also after restrictive procedures as well, and not just after malabsorptive procedures. These are the main three mechanisms for bone loss after bariatric surgery. So the first is mechanical unloading. We have reduced muscle construction forces and mechanical unloading due to the rapid uh, um, decrease of the lean body mass and uh, the weight loss. We have hormonal changes, including uh, hormones that are secreted from the gut, as well as from the adipose tissue. Most of these changes are negative to the bone. And of course, we have nutritional deficiencies and malabsorption. Here we can see that maybe in the short term after restrictive procedures, not only after uh, malabsorptive procedures, we see some improvement in vitamin D levels and in elevated PTH. But if we look at the long term, four or five years and more after the surgery, uh, also after restrictive procedures, we see elevated PTH and nutritional deficiencies, including calcium malabsorption and vitamin D deficiency. The surgical type impacts the amount of bone loss after the surgery. So as I said, most of the studies we have are based on a gastric bypass procedure, which is restrictive and, and contains also malabsorptive component. And the amount of bone loss is particularly striking in the total hip and the femoral neck, where we see during the first 12 months after gastric bypass, a percentage of between six to 11 um, uh, percentage of, of uh, bone mineral density loss. These are quite striking because it could be comparable to the first three, four years of what a woman uh, in her menopause is experiencing. Comparing to that, when we look at other procedures, we can see that gastric band, uh, we have less extent of uh, uh, bone loss between two to 3%. Uh, this is not surprising as this is mostly, mostly restrictive procedure and the bone loss mainly derives from the weight loss. And for sleep gastrectomy, we still have most of the data are driving from, um, from studies that were um, implemented until one year after the surgery. We have less data for the longer terms. And if we look at the percentage, we see that some of them could be comparable to gastric bypass between six to 8% of the total hip and femoral neck uh, BMD loss. If we look at BPD, we see many studies demonstrating metabolic bone disease uh, complications, uh, which were very common after this uh, substantial malabsorption pr procedure. For OAGB, we're quite in a conflicting situation. Uh, this procedure actually have restrictive and a malabsorptive um, um, major, major component, but we have very low and limited data for the short term as well as the long term uh, um, period. But the uh, initial data that we have already shows uh, a very significant bone loss with initial fundings of 13, 12% for the first post operative year of bone loss. This is one study, for example, that we've uh, performed in sleep gastrectomy um, procedure in our patients. And you can see that the amount of bone loss is comparable here to gastric bypass between six to 7% of BMD loss in the total hip and the femoral neck. This is significant. And when we compare different subpopulation, we saw that women that were above 50 years old tend to uh, maybe lose weight, lose uh, less weight after the surgery, but lose more bone after the surgery, even despite in, uh, of losing uh, less weight. And when we looked at the most extreme bone loss after the surgery, the highest percentage, we saw that this percentage of extreme bone loss contains a lot of women in their early 20s or less, even less than 20 years old patients, which means this is another population at risk for bone loss. 
So mainly we concluded from the study that we have subgroups of patients which are in more risk for bone loss, including uh, women about 50 years old, those who lose more weight after the surgery, and sometimes the younger patients, the younger females in their early 20s or under 20s, which tends to lose more weight and more bone after the surgery. So what are the most management strategies that we know according to the available studies that we have to prevent or to attenuate bone loss after bariatric surgery? We can name a few of them. When we look at the lifestyle-based interventions in bariatric surgery populations, we can look here at the physical activity uh, strategy, and you can see that in all three uh, available um, studies that uh, uh, targeted physical activity as the main component of the intervention, all of these studies succeeded to decrease the amount of bone loss and lean body mass loss after the surgery. So this is quite significant strategy. The other strategy is nutrients and uh, supplementation studies. Uh, in most of these studies, we use the used interventions of vitamin D, calcium, and protein. If you look at the last study here, this study is a very unique study uh, performed in Vienna 2016. And in this unique study, the investigator used all of these multi-component interventions, including pre- and post-operative loading of uh, high doses vitamin D, together with supplementation of sufficient calcium, protein supplementation and physical activity, aerobic and strength activity. And they uh, succeeded to show that after two years, postoperatively after gastric bypass and sleep hysterectomy, the amount of uh, bone loss and lean body mass loss was lower in the intervention group. So based on this available data, we can say that our strategy is going to focus on four different components for our patients when targeting bone as a prevention. And we want to look and to have a sufficient uh, um, supplementation and intake of calcium, vitamin D, protein, and combine a sufficient physical activity for our patients. If we want to summarize the management strategies and look at the current guidelines that we have uh, for a, a clinical practice to prevent or to attenuate bone loss, we would need to focus on the periods pre and post, post uh, surgery. In the, the pre-surgery period, we mostly want, first of all, of course, to correct nutritional deficiencies. We want to routinely screen uh, the, the most known uh, tests, the biochemical measures that I mentioned earlier, including vitamin, serum vitamin D, serum calcium, PTH, phosphorus, albumin, and 24 urinary calcium secretion. And we want to evaluate DEXA in specific target uh, population at risk, including uh, females uh, above 65 years old, men above 70 years old, people with history of fractures or bone loss, or people that have used chronic medication that impairs uh, bone loss or bone uh, status like corticosteroids. According to the SMBS position statement released in uh, last year, there still remain insufficient data to support universal screening uh, of DEXA prior to surgery in all the patients, but we should do it for these at-risk population that I've just mentioned. In the post-surgery period, we mainly want to give enough supplementation for the prevention of nutritional deficiencies, again, according to the latest guidelines, focusing in calcium, in vitamin D and protein, insufficient amount in intake and supplementation, and of course, to incorporate moderate uh, insufficient aerobic and strength physical activity. We're talking mainly about 150 minutes per week, together with, with two or three strength training per week. We also want to have routine screening for the same measurements that I mentioned for the preoperative period, uh, targeting bone uh, um, status, including uh, serum calcium, vitamin D, and et cetera. DEXA scan after the surgery is, uh, should be done for all bariatric patients in all procedures, uh, regularly two years after the initial procedure, and then every two to five years after the surgery until we have stable state of the bone. Regarding treatment for a uh, dysplasia and clinical deterioration, of course, we want to uh, correct the deficiencies of the uh, vi vitamin D, calcium, and protein, but we also need to consider and to refer our patients 
for an expert, for an endocrinologist in any case of decreased, massive decrease in bone loss, and of course, in the case of T scores below minus 2.5. To summarize, bone loss post bariatric surgery depends on the amount of weight loss uh, after the surgery together with the surgical type. And the high risk population includes postmenopausal women, patients with pre existing conditions associated with low bone mass, patients with extreme and rapid weight loss after the surgery, and of course, adolescents and young females and uh, women above 50 years old. And the comprehensive clinical evaluation should always include sufficient nutritional and medical counseling discussion with our patients about bone status and giving and advising them for sufficient intake of calcium, vitamin D and protein and combining physical activity. Thank you very much, Tara, for an absolutely fascinating talk. And, and thank you again for your recommendations for practice. I think the viewers will agree. Very, very helpful with that. Um, again, I, I apologize for the ongoing technical problems with, with, the, with the cameras. But um, in the interest of time, I'd like to move on to the polls, which we'd like to do before Laura Hewson's talk. Um, if we could put up the, the polls, please. So in my clinic, vitamin D and calcium deficiencies are treated with additional oral supplementation before undergoing surgery. So we'll have four, four poll questions before Laura's talk. And the second poll question, in my experience, most patients achieve the desirable amounts of daily calcium intake from food only in the long term after bariatric surgery. Very interesting. I'm looking forward to the discussion after the talks. And our third poll, I advise daily additional vitamin D and calcium supplementation to all my patients. Interesting. And the final poll, I've encountered patients who did not respond to high dose oral colocalsperol supplementation. Thank you very much for your participation with the polls, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce the soon-to-be Dr. Laura Hewson. Hello, everyone. My name is Laura, and I'm a PhD candidate at Vitalis Obesity Clinic and Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Um, my PC focuses on the nutritional consequences of bariatric surgery and also strategies on how we can improve nutritional status in these patients. And my presentation of today will mainly focus on vitamin D and calcium. So, 
So what we will discuss today, I will start with a short introduction about vitamin D and calcium. Then I will talk about the consequences of bariatric surgery, and I will end with some clinical practice. So to start with um, the introduction about vitamin D and calcium. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin that plays an important role in bone metabolism. And it helps to regulate the amount of calcium and also phosphate in the body. And furthermore, vitamin D also seems to have some anti-inflammatory and also immune modulating properties. There are two main forms of vitamin D. The first one is ergocalciferol, which is present in plants, some fish and fortified foods. And we also have colocalciferol, vitamin D3, which is only found in animal source foods. And this is also the form of vitamin D that is synthesized in the skin by sunlight. Um, both are effectively absorbed into the bloodstream. However, the liver metabolizes them differently. So for the absorption, vitamin D obtained from um, sun exposure, foods and supplements must undergo two hydroxylations in the body for activation. So the first hydroxylation first step occurs in the liver and then it's um, there vitamin D is converted into 25 hydroxy vitamin D, so known as calcidiol. This is the inactive form. This is also the main circulating form of vitamin D as its blood levels reflect uh, the body's storage of these nutrients. The second step, the second hydroxylation occurs primarily in the kidney and it forms the physiologically active 1.25 dehydroxy vitamin D also known as calcitriol. And although uh, 1.25 dehydroxy vitamin D is the active circulating form of vitamin D, uh, measuring this level is not very helpful because it has a short half-life measured in hours and it is quickly and tightly regulated by the kidney. So levels of 1.25 dehydroxy vitamin D do not typically decrease until vitamin D deficiency is defined severe. So that is why um, it is recommended to measure 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. Uh, deficiency is defined most often as a serum level below 50 nanomoles per liter or below 20 nanograms per milliliter. Um, and a deficiency is associated with some unfavorable outcomes, mostly uh, regarding bones and skeletal outcomes such as fractures and bone loss. And together with PTH, vitamin D is very important to maintain calcium homeostasis in the bloodstream. So when serum vitamin D levels are low, um, the active absorption of vitamin of, of calcium will decrease. And as a result, calcium is mobilized from the bone tissue in the bloodstream, which is called bone resorption, as we also heard in the talk of Taiyin. And eventually this can lead to rickets in children and osteoporosis in adults. And recent large um, observational data have suggested that about 40% of all Europeans are vitamin D deficient and that 13% are severely deficient. So it's quite common also in our patient population, which I will come back to later in this presentation. Then calcium. Calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body. It makes up much of the structure of bones and teeth and it allows normal bodily movement by keeping our tissue strong and flexible. And the body also needs calcium for muscles to move and for nerves to carry messages between the brain and every body part. Um, furthermore, calcium is used to help blood vessels move blood and to help release hormones and enzymes. Every day we also lose calcium to our skin, nails, hair, but also sweat, urine and feces. And our bodies cannot produce its own calcium. So that's why it's important to get enough calcium from the food that we eat. Um, because otherwise it will be taken from the bones, as I mentioned before. Um, since almost all calcium, about 98%, is stored in the bones. So the body can use them as a source of calcium to maintain uh, good levels of calcium. So calcium absorption. Calcium is absorbed in uh, two ways, by active transport and by passive diffusion. And the active transport of Calcium is vitamin D dependent. So it needs the presence of active vitamin D, calcitriol. And therefore the, the bioavailability of calcium depends on your vitamin intake and your vitamin D status. 
There's also an inverse relationship between calcium intake and absorption. When intake is low, more calcium will be absorbed and vice versa. Um, and also the way of absorption is dependent on calcium intake. So in high or adequate calcium intakes, most absorption will take place via passive diffusion. Well, with low intake, active transport is upregulated. Total uh, calcium levels can be measured in serum or plasma. However, serum levels do not reflect nutritional status. Um, that could be because of their tight homeostatic control. And in some cases, levels of ionizer free calcium um, are also measured. Reference values are assay dependent, so they vary uh, quite a lot, but in most cases, a value of below 2.2 millimoles per liter or 9 milligrams per deciliter will be considered deficient. And as mentioned before, calcium deficiency can reduce bone strength and lead to osteoporosis, which is um, characterized by fragile bones and increased risk of falling. Another effect of chronic calcium deficiency is osteo osteomalacia. And this means that there is a defect in the mineralization of the bone. So in the picture on the right, you can see the differences between the two, osteoporosis and osteomalacia. Osteoporosis is a decrease in the mass of the bone, but the composition of the bone is normal. Whereas in osteomalacia, the total mass may be normal, but the bone itself is soft and weak because it's not properly mineralized. So quantity versus quality. Then the effect of varying surgery on vitamin D and calcium status. Um, vitamin D deficiency in the bariatric surgery population is multifactorial. So some factors being related to obesity, which might not resolve completely after surgery, and others may be related to the type of the surgical procedure and or its consequences. To start with the obesity related factors, obesity does not affect the skin's capacity to synthesize vitamin D. However, greater amounts of subcutaneous fat insulate more of the vitamin because it's a fat soluble vitamin. So people with obesity might need greater intakes of vitamin D to achieve levels similar to those of people of a normal weight. Um, other factors could include less exposure to sunlight and maybe because of a lower mobility, lower participation in outdoor activities, um, different clothing habits, but of course also eating habits and lifestyle may also play a role. So in the systematic review, they found that mean vitamin D levels in people with obesity before surgery were persistently low. Um, so they were low in all studies below 30 nanograms per milliliter and for almost half of the studies at or below 20 nanograms per milliliter. Um, you can see a difference between uh, the colors and bars. The red bars represent studies with a mean BMI above 50. Blue is a mean BMI between 45 and 50, and green are studies with a mean BMI of below 45. So this indicates that vitamin D deficiency is already a big issue before undergoing surgery. Here you can see um, where the different nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. And after surgery, especially for the malabsorptive procedures, you can see that the primary absorption sites of vitamin D and calcium such as the duodenum and the proximal part of the unum are bypassed. Um, but we do not only observe these deficiencies after the very more absurd procedures, also after, for example, the sleeve gastrectomy. And this can be due to um, the reduction of gastric acidi acidity that then increase, um, decreases calcium uptake, but also dietary intolerance, reduced intake of dairy products, vomiting, and non adherence to supplement recommendations may worsen vitamin D and calcium status. So, some uh, management strategies, intakes, and needs, and supplementation for clinical practice. We can uh, fulfill our vitamin D requirements by either ingesting vitamin D or by being exposed to the sun for enough time to produce adequate amounts. However, during the winter months between October and early March, we do not make enough vitamin D from sunlight. Of course, this also depends on the place that you live, time of day, uh, length of day, cloud cover, sunscreen, uh, etc. And unlike dietary vitamin D, you cannot overdose vitamin D produced in the skin by the sunlight. Um, if your body already has enough, your skin simply produces less. But vitamin D is also found in a small number of foods. 
um, mostly the fatty fish, red meat, liver, egg yolks, and fortified foods. So for example, in some countries, the milk can be fortified with vitamin D, um, some spreads, breakfast cereals, orange juice, uh, etc. Where calcium um, sources of dietary calcium are dairy products, fish with soft bones, green leafy vegetables, and also again, the fortified foods. So a sufficient intake from foods can be quite a challenge, especially when you eat a vegetarian or even a vegan diet. And alternative sources of dietary calcium and vitamin D can then be obtained from, for example, soy foods, again, the fortified foods, beans, peas, and lentils, but for example, also mushrooms can contain vitamin D when they are grown with exposure to UV um, light, and of course, supplementation and sun exposure. However, in our population, whether or not being vegan, vegan or vegetarian, dietary intake is almost uh, always insufficient to maintain optimal vitamin D and calcium status. And therefore, the lifetime use of supplementation is required. So I will um, repeat the slides that Fa'ir already showed during her presentation with the ASMBS guidelines. So before surgery, it is recommended to include vitamin D and calcium in the screening and to correct for potential deficiencies. And after surgery, vitamin D and calcium should be evaluated every six to 12 months. Four vitamin D supplements can contain vitamin D2 or D3. However, most evidence indicates that vitamin D3 increases certain vitamin D levels to a greater extent and to maintain these higher levels for a longer period than vitamin D2. For calcium, the two most common forms of calcium are calcium carbonate and calcium citrate. In people with low level of stomach acid, the solubility rate of calcium carbonate is lower, which could reduce the absorption of calcium from the supplements unless they are taking with a meal. And calcium citrate is less dependent on stomach acid for absorption, so it can be taken without a food as well. And moreover, calcium absorption is best when it's consumed in no more than uh, 500 milligrams at one time. So in case of an intake of, for example, 1500 milligrams per day, the dose should be rather split into three times than taking it all at once. For the treatment of deficiencies um, in patients with severe vitamin D um, deficiency, you could supplement in doses of uh, 50,000 IU one to three times weekly or 3,000 to 6,000 IU per day. But in case of severe malabsorption, higher doses may uh, even be required. And in fact, there is a high variability in the response to vitamin D supplementations in our population. So in a small group of patients, serum vitamin D levels remain insufficient despite this high dose. Um, and then intramuscular um, cholecholesterol administration has been suggested as an alternative treatment. Within our research group, we have performed a small study to evaluate the efficacy of the vitamin D injections. And we evaluate the injections of a 300,000 IU cholecalciferol. And patients had been on this high dose um, treatment for at least three to six months before it was deemed ineffective. So here you can see the response in serum vitamin D level after the first injection. You can see that uh, at baseline it was um, around 32 nanomoles per liter, ranging from 8 to 50. And at serum levels peaked between four to eight weeks after the injection, and then it declined again. And this, this is also seen um, when, we, um, when we divided the, the serum levels into deficient or sufficient. You can see that um, serum levels were above 15 animals per liter in uh, most patients at four and eight weeks. And then after 12 weeks, uh, the number of deficient patients uh, increases again. It's also good to know that serum levels of calcium did not significantly change during uh, the 12 weeks after the uh, first injection. Another important finding of our study was about the injection size. So the first two patients received the injection according to common practice in the gluteus maximus, so in the buttock. And one patient responded very well to this injection, as you can see, but the other patient did not respond at all. And when taking differences in BMI into account, we suspected that the needle might have been too short to reach the gluteal muscles in this patient, so in a patient with a high BMI, and that all cholecalciferol might have been deposited in the subcutaneous fat. So that is why the injection site was changed to the delta muscle instead. 
So for patients with a persisting vitamin D deficiency despite high dose or treatments, well, vitamin D injections may be an uh, effective alternative and we would advise, advise to start with one injection every two months until levels stabilize and then reduce the interval to three to six months. For the hypervitaminosis of vitamin D and calcium, um, there is no international consensus on the safe upper, lip, upper level for uh, vitamin D supplementation. And the Endocrine Society um, is, is given a, an upper limit of 10,000 IU, while the IOM and the European Food and Safety Authority, they were recommend to stay below 4,000 IU per day. Um, however, uh, reports of vitamin D overdose are rare in literature. So mostly uh, vitamin D intoxication can occur when serum levels are greater than 150 nanograms per milliliter. Um, for calcium, the upper limit is 2,000 to 2,500 milligrams per day, depending on the age. And in this case, hypercalcemia, so serum levels greater than 10.5 milligrams per deciliter, also uh, rare. So to conclude, the take home messages of this presentation. Um, I hope you now realize that vitamin D and calcium are important nutrients in the maintenance of bone health, that lifetime additional supplementation is required after bariatric surgery because of the uh, the decreased absorption and that intramuscular treatment can be effective in patients who do not respond to high dose oral supplementation. So that was my presentation and I would like to thank you all for attending. Thank you very much, Laura. That was an excellent, excellent talk. I'd just like in the interest of time, I'd like to move forward and introduce the panelists again, Violetta Moisa, Bettina Dreschel, and Shiri Sheriff dagan And I'd like to go on straight to the questions. We've, we've got quite a few here that have come through. The first one, excellent talk. So thank you, thank you to our thank you to our speakers. And um, the question is: um, kidney stones are a major problem after bariatric and metabolic surgery. How to handle this, especially if we increase calcium intake? Would one of our panelists like to take that, please? Yes, sure. Thank you, Yitka. Congratulations to the rest of the uh, persons uh, in this webinar. I, I also enjoyed very much your talks. I think you were very uh, direct to the focus, and you know, you you highlight the whole things that are important to consider. So for this question. Um, I think that we have to consider that the calcium uh, that we are giving to our patients are not tremendously high, considering that there is not a full absorption. So we need to give this amount of calcium to just be able to absorb a, an amount that we are not completely sure how much is the absorption. And also we need to consider that if there is no history of kidney stones before surgery, so we just need to carefully control the levels in the labs analysis during the follow-ups. That's another reason why follow-ups, nutritional follow-ups are very important during uh, the supplementation. We, we saw uh, that this is important before surgery um, and also after surgery, this could also explain that. But again, to focus, um, when there is no history of kidney disease, we just need to be aware and uh, control what is the level of creatinine and other markers that can alert us about this problem. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Violetta. Our second question is, given that the evidence base for optimal serum vitamin D levels is poor, and also for optimum calcium intake following bariatric surgery is not known, what can we do to improve the evidence base? Would one of our panelists like to take that question? Yes, I can answer. So first of all, thank you for the great lectures and regarding the questions. So we need to do more research, of course, and basically more RCTs, which assess a, a different doses of vitamin D and calcium and bone outcomes in different populations. 
Uh, so that's what we need to do in order to increase our knowledge. Um, another thing that I want to add is regarding to calcium, which the recommendations are based on food and supplements. So we need to assess the intake of calcium uh, of our patients by food records or by 24-hour recall, and then to give uh, the supplementation based on our knowledge about the uh, intake. So it's really important and, and we need to be more cautious uh, with supplementation and to, to, to understand the whole picture before giving uh, the exact amount of supplementation. That was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next question, and I put to the panelists, what is the treatment or what would you recommend treatment for bariatric patient with osteopenia? Anybody like to take that question? Um, I, I can add a little um, more of a, more of a reflection than, a, than an answer. I think that mm -hmm. for these a kind of patients, we uh, have to first uh, consider which kind of surgery of procedure we are going to perform. Probably uh, considering that a malabsorptive procedure is going to be worse um, at the long term. Um, I think that the treatment would be uh, the same, probably make um, a scan, a DEXA scan first to know from what is the status of the bone before bariatric surgery and then try to supplement and carefully treat all these uh, uh, issues before bariatric surgery. If anyone else can add something. I can maybe add a bit. It's the ear. Thank you, Violetta, for your answer. I think it's important also to remember to refer our patients to an endocrinologist in any case that we see uh, T-scores or Z-scores uh, below minus uh, 1, which is osteopenia, and of course below minus 2.5, which is osteoporosis. Uh, for further evaluation and testing and, of course, further treatment, sometimes uh, medications also. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, both. Um, very interesting question next here. Um, it, again, the, the, uh, the question, thank you very much for a great presentation. My question to the panel is what should we tell our patients regarding bone health when planning for surgery? Well, which one of you would like to take that? I, I can answer. So I okay. think we should tell our patients that uh, the bariatric surgery is a risk factor for bone deterioration and they need to have the right knowledge. And there are two things that they can do. First is monitoring to do the, uh, the right examination as uh, Tay and Lawa said in their lectures. And the, and the second thing is prevention. As they said, they should do the right thing in terms of uh, calcium and vitamin, uh, vitamin D intake and supplementation and protein intake and physical activity. So there are things that they can do in order to prevent or to decrease the bone deterioration uh, after the surgery. So this is thing that we, we should say to our patient before the surgery, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, another question here. When would it be wise to discuss bone health issues with our patients at the clinic? What are the key issues to discuss and talk about with the patients? So it's a nice follow-on question from the last one. Um, I, I can comment on that too. I think that as, as Shiri said, um, all of these issues should be discussed uh, before uh, surgery. Mm -hmm. Probably the, during the uh, course, during the information course, where we look for commitment uh, with the supplements, right? When we look for uh, those uh, things that they have to adhere, like supplements. We know that calcium is a hard supplement to tolerate. Uh, mm -hmm. the flavor, the taste, um, the tolerance is low. So we need to work on that, that to prepare them in advance, that even when they probably don't tolerate them well, they probably have to work a little harder to get one that they can tolerate. So I think that we should manage everything before surgery as we, with a multidisciplinary team, with the endocrinologist and uh, as a nutritionist, to work on adherence to the supplements and you know explaining that this is the reason why they need to be ready for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Violetta. 
Another question here is how do we engage patients for vitamin D, calcium, and higher protein intake and engage them for, for um, combining more physical activity in their everyday lives after surgery? Would anybody like, a, like to answer that? So what? Uh, well, how, what's the question? If um, how they combine? Yeah, so there's, or? There's, there's there's two questions in there. The first was how do we engage patients for vitamin D, calcium, and and higher protein intake? So get about compliance, but not just compliance, but also how to increase um, combining more physical activity in their oh, everyday yeah. lives. Well, I I think that an important one important thing is that um, supplements. It would be great that they are covered by the healthcare center, right? Um, for us in, in Spain, our experience uh, told us that when we give them for free, like um, the insurance, the startup insurance is covering for them, there is a higher adherence than if they have to buy them by themselves. Um, adherence and supply are, are two points that are always uh, together. Also, um, offering them some good products that they can tolerate or, or at least offer different kind of, of formulas. Um, I'm regarding physical activity. Well, that's a hard point for always and for us too. I mean, for everybody, um, probably offering programs, attractives, or even during, uh, I mean, in the neighborhood, like walk-ins, uh, together, like different groups that they are developing and accessible for them to walk and move more. Um, there are many, many ways that we can encourage that, but we have to focus on that and put them inside our program, bariatric program, I mean. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I can, thank you. I, I want to add uh, to the yes, thank you answer that I think uh, we should give our patients the knowledge, the tools and the advice, but they are, you know, they are deciding for themselves. But we need to give practical advice that are tailored for their patients and like, for example, physical activities. So if a person do not do any physical activities, so yes, let's start from small steps, not exactly the guidelines. Okay, but for just first of all, just to start, just to start with 10 minutes or 15 minutes or it's fine just to find to, to think about small steps and to see the patient in front of you and to, to, to do it uh, like uh, like what is uh, right for him and mm -hmm. that can help from my experience you know that's great thank you very much a really interesting question here to, to put to you three um what well, who do you think are the populations at greater risk for bone deterioration following surgery So the population at risk are uh, women, uh, uh, older women, more than 50 years old, and younger women before the uh, thick bone, and uh, mm -hmm. people with some uh, risk factor for a uh, bone disease and some um, medications like corticosteroids, things like that, that are a risk factor. Uh, by the way, there are more risk factors for bone deterioration, which is uh, uh, cigarette smoking and alcohol drinkers. So, uh, these are the, the main uh, risk factors. So we need to understand it from before the surgery and to discuss with this patient even more about uh, the bone health period to the surgery. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thank I can you very add much. a bit, uh, if, if I can add a bit for that, maybe for Shiri's answer. I think it's important to remember that uh, be, besides the general risk, there are like, like the general risk factors that are behavioral also, as Shiri mentioned, like smoking, alcohol. Uh, even some medications like long-term uh, chronic taking of PPIs or corticosteroids, uh, but there are also the biological factors, again, like sex, females, and the age, of course, uh, any estrogen deficiency situations, and etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Our, our next question is, is about protein supplementation, if, how, and when to use these with our patients. Mm, I would say always from the beginning if they are in in low levels and of course uh, right after 
and especially during the first three, four months uh, after bariatric surgery, there is already many studies showing that protein supplementation is important for more than one system in the body. Um, I think we all in the panel have this experience with, with that um, uh, issue and, and topic, also the presenters and panelists. So I think protein supplementation is part of the, of the care and long, long term uh, to focus. I mean, long term issue to focus. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can add. So, I was add something, Sherry. Yes, I just want to say that the first six months following the surgery is the critical point for fat free mass loss, and this is really critical for bone mass loss. So, uh, this is the time when we need to focus, and this is the time when patient cannot eat enough protein in most of the time. So, this is the critical time for adding supplements, or maybe to give enriched food in protein, like in our country in Israel. We have yogurts which are rich in protein. I'm sure that there are many in other countries as well. And not always we give the supplementation by supplementation, maybe by food which is rich in protein. And so this is the critical time. But of course, we need to see the diet of the patient and we know what is the recommendation for protein according to the guidelines and the uh, personal uh, um, uh, medical status. And we need to get to the recommendation by food. And if not by food, we need to add supplementation even after these six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also, uh, we also saw that building our patients that uh, including these supplements also in the, well, when, when we supply them for free too, in, inside of the, of the insurance, um, the adherence is also lower, I mean, higher than when they have to buy it from them by themselves. So this is another accessibility, is another important point that we should encourage, right? To, to give access to physical activity program, protein supplementations, while we have to help patients to adhere to all these aspects, right? That are very important. And it seems to be long at long term. So they have to do it for long term after bariatric surgery. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, just the next question, and thinking about this just solely in the comp in the context of bone health, how long after surgery should our patients be followed by the bariatric MDT? Who'd like to answer that? I can answer. It's a lifelong. <laughs> That's what I can answer. It's for the rest of the life. This is something that they should know from advance, and this is what we recommend. Definitely, um, it's the ear again. I can also add um, about that that the fracture risk. Uh, we know that it's manifest not early than two years uh, post surgery. So of course, long term and like like Shiri said, lifelong uh, follow up. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. The questions keep keep coming in. Um, the next question, who should be in charge? The primary care physician, specialist such as an endocrinologist, and is primary care ready to advise and support bariatric patients long term? So sort of looking past 10 years post-surgery? Mm. Um, Could you? Well, I, yeah. Anyone wants to? Come, no, no, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Tahir. Uh, well, just mentioning that this is uh, an important, an important uh, thing because the uh, bariatric patients need to be followed long term, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, tertiary hospitals that are the place where bariatric is performed uh, have not. Uh, the resources to follow them at long term. So at this point, primary care physicians need to take over on on all these follow up. Um, so I think we need we should work together on on that, like um, giving them everything that they need to be familiar or uh, you know involved uh, from from the beginning and. For me, it has to be have to be a, a 
we have to manage the patient together during the first five, ten years probably, and then primary care needs to work on prevention, right? Um, but I, I think that at the beginning, endocrinologist and a specialized, a specialized multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team needs to to cover all these needs that our patients have. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question. So based on your, your expertise, panelists, what are the main barriers for calcium and vitamin D adherence that patients experience? And what is your advice to overcome these barriers? Hmm. I think it's. I think that this is the amount of pills that they need to take, and if we can concentrate the the supplementation for the minimum pills as we can, so it can uh, increase the endurance of our patients. That's, this is from our from our experience, uh, especially in the long term. Especially in the long term, when the endurance is is unfortunately reduced. So this is this is my advice from our experience. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And again, question here, thank you for great presentations. What amount of weight loss is considered excessive to put a patient at higher risk of bone loss? Mm. Just I can maybe up. comment just about this. Um, there's not really um, amount of weight that we can say that this is a precise amount of weight that is more related to um, to specific bone loss amount, but mm -hmm. I would say that we really need to spot those patients with higher risk, the ones that you see that mm -hmm. they have very fast uh, and very extreme uh, weight loss during a very short period. So this should be uh, very uh, important for us to spot those specific patients. So it should mm -hmm. be very individualized case and treatment. Yeah, so it's really it's multifactorial. It's not just the weight loss. It's other, like yeah. you just say, we discussed before. Their their patients we know to be there's a higher the risk surgery of bone type loss. and and patients factors, biological, bio, bio, uh, mm -hmm. behaviors, and etc. Of course, I yeah. I could add that also it's important to um, study why is what is the reason for this excessive amount of weight loss. Um, if there is no complication, so we need to make sure the nutritional status is, is adequate. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, resolve the issue that is leading the patients to an excessive amount of weight loss. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. And again, very, very interesting question here and put to the panel. Have you seen um, dental health issues, for example, mm -hmm. more decays, and you know, loose teeth post bariatric surgery tooth loss? This is a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think we don't regularly check for this. I hadn't focused on that um, specifically. Just, uh, just I, we just faced the problem with two cases of pica that destroy the health, I mean, the bones or teeth status, but not in the general population, but it's it's a good thing to to address. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank I, you. I can, add, I can add that there is lack of knowledge regarding uh, tooth and, and bariatric surgery, but I think uh, maybe the more malabsorptive uh, procedure are um, more at risk for maybe or this program, but we we don't know it for you know for for sure. We need more research in this stage. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you for that. We've got this is the unless there's more questions, we've got we've got one more question to be asked here. And and I I just know that Sherry and Ter are going to love this one. Um the one anastomosis gastric bypass is very malabsorptive. Should supplementation with calcium and vitamin D be lifelong, regardless of blood plasma levels? Mm. 
Yeah, I understand why why you say that, Itka. I think that the problem with this surgery is that we don't have uh, enough studies, enough research to say also about the bone loss, about fractures, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but taking into consideration that this procedure has a major malabsorptive component, of course, uh, from my side, I can recommend for a lifelong monitoring of the patients and recommendation for at least the, the amounts that they get that we recommend for uh, the regular gastric bypass procedure. But of course, on the top of that, I would add that it should always again be a um, um, specific case. Each patient has his specific story and adheres to supplementation and behavior and etc. So a more individualized treatment overall. Great. Thank you very much for that. I would say we've there's there's no more questions. We've we've come to the end, and I just really like to say a, a huge huge thank you to Ter and and Laura for absolutely excellent excellent talks on a fascinating fascinating subject, and also to the panelists Violetta, Bettina, and and Shiri for excellent um excellent answers and. Just thank you, and thank you to Manuela for organizing everything, and and thank you for trying to get all the um all the IT issues sorted out. Um, and just to say um, thank you to all of you for your participation, for for bearing with us, um, and and really for attending the first of what we hope are many, if so, EC integrated health webinars. Um, thank you again very much. That this this session has been re-recorded, and we will make it live so people can can listen to it afterwards but just to say thank you to thank you to everybody and stay safe